Hey, how's it going? My name's Matthew, aka EasyBot, and welcome to another live stream. Today we're going to talk about live hardware electronic music sets. The reason this is coming up is not only because my main focus and what I do here on the EasyBot channel is talk about live hardware electronic music, but it's because I have two shows coming up this week, which I'm excited to share with you. Here's a little spotlight image of those shows. Uh, one in Portland, I'll be playing with these amazing artists you see here, and another show at Substation here in Seattle. And um, I'll show this again later and see if I can direct some traffic over to these shows. But I wanted to talk about what's been going on in my head through set prep. If you follow this channel at all, or you watch these streams, or are interested in what I'm doing here, then you may have seen a stream or video about me erasing all of my music and starting over from scratch. And that is a big, huge project, a bigger project than I anticipated, and it came with a lot of stress. It created a lot of stress for me with these upcoming shows. I thought I would have enough time to completely make a new set from scratch, and um, turns out that is just that that was just a little bit beyond my uh, my scope beyond my capabilities at the time with what I had on my plate and what I have on my plate. So I ended up going back in and pulling my old set, one of my old sets back into my dig attack so that I had some more music to draw from because being really stressed out before you play a show is not ideal. That's not a good time. Going into a show stressed out is a bad time. And I do like a lot of the new music I wrote, and I do plan to play the new music that I've written. And that's going to be a part of my set, but I am incorporating some specific tunes that I like from my previous set that I think would complement my current regime of new music. So what I want to talk about is how you prepare for a live set. What, what do you do? What are the best practices? What do I do? Um, and who are the people in the live hardware electronic music community? There's a, you know, the community around live hardware electronic musicians is growing. It's, it's, it's grown exponentially since COVID because COVID got people into a lot of live hardware electronic music. And uh, I worked at the synth shop during that period and I saw it myself. I saw firsthand just like the traffic increasing immensely. And so there became more of an audience for the live hardware electronic music scene. Now there is something different about playing live hardware electronic music than it is from a, a DJ performing their producer tracks, the tracks they produce from their computer, or use live hardware, whatever whatever they did. It's a different it's a different scene entirely, and I think the reason that is, although they do they do have um, some middle ground where they do meet, where you'll see a live hardware musician playing at a DJ show where it's mostly DJs and they're maybe the only musician. This this happens, and it's great. But there's a lot of live hardware electronic musicians like myself who came from a rock and roll perspective, who came from a band perspective or a singer songwriter perspective. And as they were getting older and maybe had a little bit more disposable income through their jobs and whatnot, they lost touch with their with their bandmates or with people to play with or they live remotely and they find themselves in the hardware community suddenly and they want to play shows still. Right. And that's me. I'm one of those people. I learned techno through live hardware electronic music. I learned, well, I didn't can't say I learned electronica through it because electronica was kind of the natural progression from my indie rock background into electronic music. But I had to learn how to make electronic music. And it's a different experience preparing for a show. It's a different experience playing that show. It's a different community that you're playing to. And it's a different mindset entirely from picking up your guitar, writing a song, and going meeting up with your bandmates. You rely on yourself 100%. And that is hard. You also rely on your equipment 100%, and that is hard. Getting very familiar with your hardware electronic music equipment is essential. It's an essential function in getting prepared for a show. If you do not know your equipment very well, you are handicapping yourself for your performance. You will come across situations that are difficult. And even if you know it, like the back of your hand, you will still come across situations that are tough and you need to be prepared for that. I've come across it all too many times. So we're going to talk about all the different situations that I've run into. Some of the best practices that I've used when I'm doing a live show. I do play a lot of live shows. I know that people may think that this is just a YouTube channel about live hardware electronic music, but I do, I do perform a lot. Last year I played 
like 15 or 16 live hardware shows. Um, this year I'm playing, I may be playing three this month, but two this month so far. This year's been a little bit slower. I've been taking some time. I do love to play shows is all I'm getting at. I'm not saying I'm an expert at playing shows. I'm an expert at live hardware electronic music. I'm not saying I know everything. I'm just sharing my perspective, my experiences from what I do. And I do do this stuff. This is what I like to do. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Do whatever you want with that information. I just want you to know that I'm serious about what I'm talking about. And it comes from a place of, um, you know, love. Love for the scene, love for the game, love for the community, and love for live hardware electronic music. So what I'm working with in my current set is a lot of electron gear. As you may know, if you watch this channel, you're really, you might be into live hardware electronic music yourself. I imagine that you are, and you're probably into electron gear like I am. You probably love 303s like I do. 303 day, what, two days ago, right? Um, you probably love effects processors. And synthesizers, as you may see in the top little screen here, I have the, the Korg Neo over here. You probably love the Octatrack if you're on this channel. These are all, to me, essential pieces of gear for playing live shows. Every piece of equipment that I have picked for my setup is built around curating music for live performances and built around me being able to play with a piece of gear. That's why I chose Electron as my main piece of equipment for shows. So the first thing that I think that we need to discuss besides essential gear is, you know, why, why are you, why are we doing this? Firstly, why are we doing hardware instead of uh, using our computer? Why are we doing hardware instead of playing our guitars or bass or drums or singing or pianos? Um, you know, what is, what is our purpose? So for me, I'll tell you, my purpose in doing all of this is that it's always been my passion to perform music. This has always been a thing for me. I played and sang in bands since I was very young. It has been the most important thing in my life. And since I was a child, I dreamed of, I had the rock star dream as a kid. That was my thing, right? And I didn't, I didn't have an electronic music rock star dream at all. I found myself here because I love music technology. I have a passion for music technology. I love it. I adore it. I think it is the coolest and most fun um, hobby or passion that I can have. It is my favorite. I can't think of another thing that would be at this level of, of like where it takes my brain and like how much logic I have to use, how much creativity I have to use, uh, how much practice it takes. The craft, the whole thing is an art and it's respected by a loyal community and a lot of great friends to be made doing this kind of stuff, not necessarily just in the hardware, but in the music community. It's a different, a different kind of person. You know what I mean? You have to be highly passionate about what you're doing and fearless at times to go in front of people and share your art. That's why I do this. Why I use hardware, electronic music, equipment in general. Short story, I picked up an Octatrack because I wanted the arranger mode. And I needed stereo so that I could sample uh, drums into the Octatrack and sample synthesizers into the Octatrack, use the arranger, play my guitar, and sing with an Octatrack. And that was the goal, was to replace my bandmates. That was really what brought me here. Fell in love with the Octatrack through that process of learning the Octatrack. Very good time for me. <laughs> Still deeply in love with the Octatrack, eagerly awaiting something that could perhaps replace it. We're going to talk a little bit about the... the Chaos Replay. This is nothing where it's not a Korg sponsored video or anything, but they are letting me use this in the stream because I am going to play the show with it because I, I think it's cool. I think it's fun. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit, too. But the whole the whole th reason I'm doing this is because I needed to replace other appendages of a band, so to speak. And these pieces of equipment accomplish that goal for me. Now, when I first started playing live hardware shows, I met the community through the local synth shop. If you don't have a local synth shop, that sucks, you know, and, you know, Seattle's on the verge of, I don't know, we'll see what happens with our synth shops here and our music shops here because they're kind of getting priced out of the region because it's just expensive over here. Um, but the synth shop is a great place to meet people and find the community. And that's what happened for me. I found the synth shop. I went to school for music and I met the people from the synth shop 
and they brought me in and I ended up working there for five years and uh, ran their YouTube channel doing live hardware electronic music. And that has been a really great time for me and a really important time in my life. And it changed my trajectory in my life personally. It doesn't happen for everybody. I'm, I know everybody has different things happening in their life, different priorities and stuff. But I was in a position where I could let hardware electronic music become a priority in my life. I was, I kind of got a little lucky in that sense. Um, but anyhow, that is what brought me into the hardware. I got very familiar with it and I fell in love with the systematic procedure and creating music and step sequencers. To be honest, I fell in love with the electron sequencer and the piece of equipment that I found the most useful and the most fun in a live setting was the dig attack of all things, not, not the Octatrack. The Octatrack is something that I ended up working with more and developing a relationship with based on my needs because the Octatrack, like a modular synthesizer, like a DAW is, um, well, modular. It can change. It's, it's malleable. It's a, it allows you to morph it into a different piece of equipment that needs to fit for certain scenarios. And for me, what I wanted was live hardware electronic music effects, and I wanted live looping because I wanted to build a transition without silence because I knew that that was like this unspoken rule in live hardware music or in electronic music is that there's no downtime in a DJ set. That's not the most important thing in the world. Let me reiterate this. I do, I make these Octatrack templates, right? I make, and a lot of people are using them for their live sets with live hardware electronic music and, and whatever. And uh, one of the things I'm always telling people to use is the loopers, the four bar looper, the eight bar loopers, stuff like that. Most people don't use them. <laughs> Most people don't use loopers in their sets because it's hard, to be honest. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to remember. It's stressful to loop when you're looping audio it takes you to a place where you're like, well, I hope there's not silence on the other end of this loop. You know, you're just kind of like putting the whole show in the hands of the looper. And that's stressful. I understand. I think you can learn to rely on it. Just put some practice into it. But I do want to talk about looping because we're also going to talk about using the chaos replay as a live hardware electronic looper to transition from part to part. It's also a piece of equipment that you could use um, with a DJ set because that is a, you know, kind of its original purpose. Anyhow, I just wanted to to mention the the importance of of looping, but also that most people aren't using it anyway. In at least in the live hardware electronic music scene that I have seen. So so far, so far, my thoughts on live hardware electronic music is that it's hard. This is a hard hobby. You have to learn all the equipment that you're going to perform with at an immense detail. And when you don't learn them at an immense detail, you're not you're not at your best. You're not performing at your best, and you're not also able to acclimate to situations that may be um, quite stressful. I was going to pull this uh, USB cable out, but I realized it's not plugged in the Octatrack. The Digitec doesn't have that USB wind problem that the Octatrack has with the USB cable. Um, yeah, so this is this is a tough situation. So you have to pick your equipment very wisely. What are you going to use? You know, do you want to bring a large keyboard with you to a show? Do you not? You know, are you going to get booked for a DJ gig or not? Well, if you're playing techno or house music, sure, you might get booked for a DJ gig. If you're not playing techno or house music, I don't imagine that a, a club is really going to want to book you. And that's just my experience or my opinion, um, just from what I've seen. I, I, I put on shows, I run some shows, so I don't mind what you play as long as there's some drums in it. Uh, but that's me. I'm, I'm hosting the, the hardware community scene. The DJ scene is much, much deeper than that. It's been around, I think, uh, longer in a way than this newer vibe of the hardware electronic community scene has been around. This is something that spawned more recently where people are really focused in this dollless setup. And to me, it's not about being dollless at all. It's not about that you can't have a DAW in your setup. It's about... Uh, living within these restrictions. And it's not that I don't like the DAW. I mean, today was what, Ableton Live 12 release day? I downloaded it, I updated it, I checked it out. I'm like, cool, it's got the rhythm generator. I honestly am not inspired to play uh, music on my computer. I'm just not. Maybe I need a better control. I mean, I have a push three, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not as inspired to do that. I'm highly inspired by these machines. I, like another guitar player, want to touch my instrument. I want to have an intimate relationship with my instrument 
you know, not in any sort of weird manner. I just want to have a relationship with it where it's a tactile relationship. I can communicate with it with my hands. I can see what's going on. I know where it is physically in space and time. These are important parts for me in my music experience and my creativity experience. I want to touch the gear that I'm making music on. Intimate. Yes. The computer is not an instrument for me. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. Brother, may we have loops. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, so the, these are these are my unabridged uh, thoughts on live hardware electronic music sets. So as I'm putting together my new set for a show that I'm playing on Thursday uh, in Portland called Live in the Depths at 7 o'clock, I'll put the flyer back up for you. I was going through and I was like, okay, also I want to talk about mixing for live shows. We're going to talk about that too. And uh, my experiences with that and kind of what you can expect a little bit. But I'm preparing for the show. I got, you know, three to four new songs that I wrote. I'm going to, I don't know how long, the, I don't even know how long the set is supposed to be at the Portland show, but I'm allowed, I'm playing at the very end. So I can probably play as long as I want, I hope. So I'm probably going to play as long as I can until they make me stop. And I, because I pulled my old set in, so now I have a lot of music. So I want to talk about preparing a set and how do we go about moving from project to project within our pieces of equipment, whether it's a Novation Circuit, a Polyon Tracker, an M8, an Octatrack, a Digitech, whatever piece of equipment it has, there are downtimes between projects, unless it's an M8, because then there is no downtime between projects. Literally just boots right up. Pretty convenient piece of gear for that kind of stuff. But the hands-on control with the M8 is limited, which is why I still end up picking this equipment that I have right here for my personal shows. So when I'm preparing for a set, what I like to do is I do this first. Yeah, what's up, Drew? Thanks for the tip. What I like to do when I'm preparing for a set is I grab a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, and I get a pen, and I start going through my music which is what I'm going to do a little bit with you today. I already have an idea of the, I already know what songs I'm going to pick, I think, but I'd start going through my set. I start listening to the patterns and then I start thinking, how am I going to transition from one pattern to the next? Do my projects live in these, have these separate identities or am I playing all in one project? Something I often recommend to people when they're preparing, when they're starting to write music and their goal is to play shows, not everybody's goal is to play shows. So that's not the most important thing in music. The most important thing in music production is your experience doing it, in my opinion, unless your job is to generate music from your income, then it's different. But if you're doing this because you love doing it, then it should be all about your enjoyment of the process of the creation of the music and the process of sharing it with others. In my opinion, <laughs> that is. So when I'm preparing a new set, I pick my essential pieces of equipment for my set. For me, I need a mixer and or summing mixer. To, for me, it's going to be the Octatrack. I also bring with me a Yamaha summing mixer just to have another mixer in case I need it, in case I decide that I want to have a microphone or some other external equipment, which we'll discuss as well. Um, I like to have a mono synthesizer. That would be the Syntact. The 303 is an extra because I'm playing my old set. It has a lot of 303 in it, so I needed to get the 303 back out. Or TB03, let's, you know, it's not the same. Very close, but not the same. I like to have a drum machine or a sampler. I think a sampler is essential. So I have the Dig Attack. This, I like to have live performance effects. So I use the Octatrack, once again, filling two roles. I could use an RMX 1000. I could use a DJ mixer like a DB4. I could use a Korg Chaos pad of some sort. I could use the Chaos Replay like I'll show off today. That kind of stuff. I want to be able to have dynamic effects to move from pattern to pattern or part to part within a song. These are things that I think are essential and important for an electronic music show. So one of the cool things, and <laughs> paper is so analog, one of the cool things about electronic music is that the rules around how an instrument functions are broken in electronic music. With a guitar, we are limited by the agility of our hands and our practice and our theory knowledge and all that, right? With other instruments, piano, anything, anything acoustic, we're limited there and we're limited to the physics of that instrument, the literal 
physics the sound of the instrument or the instrument sound generates, right? In electronic music, I can take a drum pattern and pitch the whole pattern down. I can't pitch a drum set down during a live set unless it's being processed through effects somehow or it's an electronic drum kit. Still, once again, electronic. I have, I'm able to break the rules of standard music. So if we're not doing that in our music production, we're kind of missing out a little bit. So I think it's really fun to, you know, break some of the rules of, not rules or some of the dependencies that we have on acoustic instruments by using electronic hardware. I think it's a powerful tool to make new sounds. And that's why this has become popular, I think, is because of the future of music. Music is going to continue to evolve. I'm soon there's going to be AI music that's actually decent. Right now it's garbage, but soon there's going to be thing and like it's going to be we're going to have to learn to use it in some way. I don't know. That's a whole other discussion, but it's going to happen. We have to you know be prepared for it. But another thing about breaking the rules, right? Or you know finding ways to manipulate sounds in the in the future that is electronic music. Right? I mean, I think, I think that's, I think that'll be something. Anyway, I definitely don't want to have a discussion about that. So let's not, let's not go off on that tangent. So I am, I'm currently putting together my set and I have some songs picked out, right? I have a couple, I have two projects that I have to work with. So this is where we come up to the limitations of our hardware. Even though we have this awesome ability to do whatever we want with hardware because it can break all these limitations of acoustic instruments and give us these other things, we also are limited by it. We're limited by its, its workflow. So some workflows are harder than others. Some workflows do not integrate with other pieces of gear, right? It's difficult sometimes to integrate non-electron gear in an electron setup. It's def definitely difficult to integrate like a Roland setup into an electron setup. Like those two things, they don't go together very well, right? They're just tough. There's, there's just, the workflows are entirely different. So I usually stick to a certain ecosystem because it's simpler for me to manage in my mind. I know where to look on all of these instruments because they're similar, right? It does me a favor. It's helping me out. The sound quality, of course, of these instruments is great, but it's really doing me a solid by having the same workflow across the machines. So I try and pick something like that. If you're into the Roland workflow, I recommend you stick with the Roland workflow. You're gonna have a better sound. You're gonna do a better job. You know, that's, you know, that's my thoughts on that is, you know, do what works for you and practice, practice, practice. That's something my mother would always say. It's like, you wanna get good at painting? My mom was a painter. She's like, you wanna get good at painting? It's not about being born with the technique or being born with this magic skill. Some people are born with a little bit extra something, something, but. It's all about practice, it's all about a lot, a lot of practice. And as I keep mentioning so far throughout the stream, practice, 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 practice. You got to practice them all. You got to practice them all deeply and passionately over and over that four bar loop that whoever you may share your home with has to listen to for 10 hours straight and they hate you for it. Keep doing it anyway, because it's so important that you do it. It's so important that you let these loops loop and you listen and you listen and you get sick of it. And so you make a new version of it. I think that stuff's important. That's a sign of your practice and your perseverance through your music production. I think that's just a sign of a, a hard working musician is that they're listening to their music. I think that's important. So listen to your music a lot. Bounce your set off of other people. Listen to other people's sets. Okay, so I have two projects currently. I try not to do this. I tell people that work with me on like my Patreon for like live hardware electronic music lessons or Octatrack lessons or Dig Attack M8 lessons, whatever hardware lessons they want, modular, blah, blah, blah. When we're talking about getting music production together for a show specifically, I always say this. I say, do write all your music at the same project, right? In the Electron format, we have multiple banks, we have multiple patterns. We do only have 128 slots. There are certain musical workflows that limit you to not being able to do this, like Deanne Crystal, who tipped five bucks. His music production workflow uses a project per song. I know a lot of people use a project per song because that's their workflow. Maybe they're using 128 slots in their Dick Attack or Syntax. Their sound banks are filling up too quickly, so they're forced to use projects as patterns. That for me is not ideal in my setup, but 
the way I've been writing my music a little bit lately, I am running out of slots faster. So I'm maybe only getting like four or five songs per project, whereas I was getting like 20 songs per project when I was trying to do this more minimal techno setup, whether it was techno or not, I was still going with the mindset of generating a minimal music production workflow. But I think it's the best practice to keep your music in the same project. I think keeping your music all in the same project is best. And here's why, because I can go from a song here. I can go from here. Let me give you, I'll just give you a little demonstration. I can go from the end of this song and we're gonna transition over to this techno track, okay? So we'll go from No downtime at all. And now I'm in a new song, like I had CDJs up here, or a computer or whatever. So I have, these are my decks, so to speak. But because I have the music in the same project, my transitions can be pretty seamless. Mind you, I just randomly grabbed an effect. I know that scene four, according to my sticker here for my templates, is a build-up effect, which is great for transitioning to a new song. Most of them are gonna work to transition you to a new song. But I didn't have to go in here, and this is something I'm gonna have to do in the show, is that I'm gonna have to go in to all of my projects on all the machines that I have, and I'm gonna have to change all of these. And when I change a project on my Octatrack, it will go to silence, because that's what the Octatrack does when it changes projects. It mutes the audio. It sends a stop command to all the machines on the Octatrack. Not ideal, not ideal. That's where something like this comes in handy. So I can have either a pattern on here, right in here with the faders, I can crossfade into this pattern. So while I'm doing this and changing them out, bam, 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 changing all my sets, I've muted this audio and they're listening to a clip here. And I could do that live if I want. I could just record the end of the song and let it loop over and over again while I change projects. Even in the Octatrack templates that I've designed, you can't do that. It just doesn't work because the Octatrack silences the audio. So you can only move through, use transitions to move through songs within a project um, if you're using the Octatrack on a project level. If you're using it, if you're sending clock to the Octatrack from an external piece of gear, you can just sit on pattern one and transition like I'm doing with the, the Chaos Replay. And that's a really ideal thing. So I think an essential piece of gear for a live hardware performance setup is a looper, an external looper. And I'm glad that Dean Crystal's in the chat here because he does some great stuff in his shows and he's very open about this information. And like, uh, I mean, a lot of people do this, but just as an example of somebody who's in the chat, you have an external piece of gear, like a, a 404, a looper, a boss looper of some sort, even a cell phone that's got some audio on it. And when you're moving through projects, you trigger it and you turn that volume up. And while you're prepping, you just give the audience something to listen to as you're moving into the next project. And that's it. That's the, that's a, I feel like that's a huge tip on you just upping your game in a live show. But this is all so much to remember because we are moving from project to project in these machines. So you have to know how to do that, know the name of your project know how to navigate multiple machines at the same time. Like this, the art of doing live hardware electronic music is, is hard. This is hard. Like, no, there's no doubt about it. This isn't easy to do. This is a hard thing to do and it requires a massive amount of practice. Anything that can give you some leverage over your show, over your workflow, that'll give you a little bit of time and downtime, anything that'll give you that is gonna help you and relieve that anxiety. I've had some some situations where I'm playing a show and if you're familiar with Octatrack, you would know that there's this this pattern settings mode here. And if you go over here and go down here, you can use the chain behavior. Chain behavior is is how does the pattern move from one pattern to the next? So as it's not necessarily like as it's chained, like one goes to two to three to four, that whole chaining thing, it's just like 
you know, when does pattern one go to pattern two? Does it use the, by default, it's set to use the pattern length, which we set here, right? In our master level, we set the pattern length, um, which you can do on all the machines. On the Dicatact and Syntact and Dicatone and all that, you use the, uh, you use the change length, the C-H-L-E-N. It's a different verbiage for what the Oxtrack represents here with the pattern change length. Anyhow, I had some sets where this value, which was controlling these machines, didn't match. So when I moved from one pattern to the next, this was set to 64 and this was set to 128. So suddenly my tempo changed and it was controlling the tempo. These patterns didn't change. Then I get into the next part and bam, I am in stress. I'm immediately stressed. I'm embarrassed. And I've been, it's happened to me multiple times in shows because I, because it's hard, basically, put it that way. It's been a long time since it happened because I've, I've re very cognizant of it now because it's been so stressful when it does happen. But I'm just saying, things like this do happen. These things happen a lot and you have to be prepared for them. <laughs> so you have to keep in mind, how am I moving from pattern to pattern? How am I going from song to song and project to project? And I do think it's a lot easier to work within a single project. But like I said, that's not an option for me at this upcoming two shows that I'm playing. I need to go from one project to another project. So I'm going to be using the Chaos Replay to accomplish this goal, either to just launch some audio or to capture a live loop. Check this out. Let's do a live loop capture. We'll go to a different song so we hear something new or a different part of this song, maybe. There's kind of a crescendo of this like techno-ish track. I'm going to live record it. It's coming in here. This is MIDI synced. Let's go to sampling. I'm sampling a quantized loop. Capturing eight bars at the moment. Okay, I can transition now with these faders. That other sample is still playing, but here we go. This is the live music. I'm no longer in this project. The machines have stopped. Music is still playing. I can go over here, grab something else. What else was I playing from this one? Okay. Imagine that I just loaded a new project instead of transitioning from one song to another, but you could do it in another song. This is the advantage of having an external looper. It doesn't have to be the replay. It could be a bunch of different instruments, but it's very helpful, right? Old song. Here we go, and a new song. Now we're in a completely different vibe. This allows you to move around in your music the same as the Octatrack does. Not, it's not this, they're not the same by any means. Um, but using the looper function, right? Having an external looper outside of your entire project that's just kind of sitting at the end of the chain will let you loop through project to project to project, allowing you to move in and out of uh, different pieces of equipment's downtime that they you know, that you can't get around. Like with Octatrack, there's downtime. So having something on the outside, I think is really important. Okay, 
we're going to now move on to a whole nother section. We've talked about, you know, kind of some of the essential gear that you need to have. What should you bring with you to a live show? What do I bring with me to a live show? I bring a lot of stuff to live shows. I bring a ton of stuff. For one, I bring my set list, which I generate, obviously, before the show, but I generate by playing my set over and over again and kind of getting a vibe. So I have my set list with me, which I've forgotten multiple times and also had to rewrite at the show. So don't forget your set list. I bring a set list. I bring doubles of almost all my cables. Not all of them, but quite a few of them. I bring a double of, like, I bring two sets of stereo pairs. I bring a bunch of extra MIDI cables. I bring extra power cables for my gear, and I bring an extra mixer, and I bring an audio recorder. These are things that I think are essential pieces of equipment to have at your show. You don't have to have an audio recorder, but I think it's important to listen back to your music after you've performed it so that you know how you did. Like, not a, you can't rely on other people to record your set. So those are things that I think are essential at getting better and better and better and just, you know, becoming a better musician, a better live performer in general is, uh, you know, reviewing your sets. What could you have done better? What could you have transitioned to better? Was your mix any good? Stuff like that. Um, so those are essential pieces of equipment. I think having a pair of headphones, albeit not necessary, you do not have to have headphones for a live show. A lot of people do not play with headphones on. If you're playing a live hardware show, you're usually playing in a setup that I think is um, viewed as uh, more like going and seeing a performer as as opposed to going and dancing. I think there's more of that. So there's just, I don't know. I don't know if that equates to what I'm trying to get at. I just mean that usually you can hear the music because it's not a club scene, right? It's not, the speakers aren't this mono projection of like eight different settings all the time. You know, that's not always the case for a live hardware show where it's you know explicitly live hardware. Um, a lot of times it's a set of speakers near you or behind you. Maybe you even have monitors facing you. So you don't necessarily need to have headphones. But I, I do think it's essential to have them pre-show so that you can test your music and also put them on during important parts of your performance so that you can pay close attention to some of the moments that you're building up to. Most of the time that I use headphones is either to stop the speakers from destroying my ears and the headphones are protecting me, um, or because I need to hear a moment in the music that it's really essential that I hear the intricate details so that I can do a, a maneuver in my performance that would be harder if I couldn't hear what was going on clearly. And that's kind of what the headphones do for me. Otherwise, I usually end up taking my headphones off during a set. I want to get into the music. I want it to be loud. I like how that feels. I think if the music, if I'm feeling the music and I'm really into it and I'm kind of getting the same experience that the crowd is getting, I'm going to start jumping around and dancing a bit and getting like so into it that I start, you know, the crowd might get into it more. You know, I get nervous when I play and, and I think having the music be loud helps me calm my nerves a bit. So I do think it's essential that you bring them. I don't think it's essential that you perform with while you're wearing them. And I think that that kind of covers it. There's not that many. I think a lot of people use a cell phone as their timer. And I think that's great. I saw uh, at the last Modbang show, a performer, Peter's Jacket, played. And it was their first time playing. And they did a great job using an Electron setup. And they had this attractive little timer with them that could you could clearly read. You don't need to do that. You could just get a cell phone. But you could buy yourself a timer. It is nice to be cognizant of when the next performer is expecting to go on. People who are playing next are usually pretty eager to either play or they're really nervous to play. And so they're just hyper aware of their situation and being aware of their time is important. Um, so you're not usually playing alone at these events. So I think that covers the essential pieces of gear. I think it is also nice to have a microphone if you can, if you're okay with sharing your voice with the audience. I think that's really helpful. Uh, I don't always bring my microphone with me, although often I am at like the mod bang events, I'm using the microphone to announce new people coming in, even if I'm playing the show. So it kind of like defeats the purpose of me bringing a mic since there's already one there. But when I go out and play, I like to bring a microphone with me. So I do plan on bringing my mic with me to the substation show and to the Portland show, just so that I can sing along with my music and or just communicate with the audience during my set and kind of let them know that I am you know, aware that they're there. And I'm talking to you and I see you and that kind of thing. I like doing that thing if I can, if I can remember to do it, if my nerves let me do it, I will try and do that. But it's again, not an essential piece of equipment. 
just nice to have. Now, another topic, because I made a little list of stuff I wanted to talk about. I know we're not doing very much music here. This is a talk, a talk show today. And um, that covers the cables and accessories, essential, essential gear and stuff like that is like, a good topic here is how, how do you how do you play a live show? Like how do you get who's gonna who's gonna have you play a live show, right? And well, depending on your area that you live in, this may be something that's incredibly difficult for you. <laughs> this might be the hardest part is actually having a place to play. And you know what? I hate. I just want to say this. I hate this because I don't like when I don't like mean people. I don't like mean people. And a lot of folks they share clips of themselves like they're out. They're at some sort of performance. A lot of times I'm following a lot of like hardware electronic musicians and it'll be a clip of them playing and maybe the audience is, is very small because the audience for electronic music is a very late night audience. It's a weekend audience. It's a club audience. It's not, it's a hard, it's a hard audience to get, you know, I feel like it's more like you're more like trying to be nine inch nails when you're doing this than you are trying to be whatever DJ, you know, pick, pick one. But I mean, you're trying to be like an electronic band, so to speak, and it's a different vibe. It's a different community around it. So getting booked is really hard. Please, when people share photos and videos of themselves at these events and there isn't that many people there at those events, don't say, where's the crowd? It's fucking rude. OK, don't do it. It's rude. And I see it all the time. And I'm always just like, what is your problem? Dude, like, why are you harassing this person? You know how hard it is to go out and share your art? It's very hard. How hard it is for a painter to share their paintings with people, for someone to, you know, just all shit. It's so vulnerable that people let themselves be, and then the community, or somebody from a community, somebody, it's usually somebody from, from a different scene looking at the hardware scene, talking smack at the hardware scene, saying like, I don't know. The saying, where's the crowd for you? It's like, well, I don't know, man. They're not, there's no one that lives in this town. That's where they are. There's nobody here. There's, you know, no one knows about this. I'm new. Whatever. I, it's just rude. Don't do it. Don't be a dick. Be cool. Be helpful. Be a cheerleader. Trust me, people will like you a lot more for it. And you'll like yourself more because it feels good to be a cheerleader. That's why people do it. So I hate that, but how you get booked for these gigs for live hardware is you just go to the venue and you ask. That's it. That's the trick. It's not magic. It's not rocket science. You don't need to talk to a promoter. Promoters promote shows. That's their job. Their job is to promote a show. They sometimes put together shows and do that whole thing. That's, you know, a promoter will do that too. But you don't have to go that route. You can do it yourself. You can put together a venue. You can find four groups of people that you like and say, hey, you want to play a show? There's this bar. They have some room. There's this club. They're not busy on this night. They're going to let us play for free. Go do it. You're going to love it. Record it and share it. It's awesome. It's a great time. And I highly encourage it. That's how you do it. It's not any harder than that. I've done it. I do it. It's fun. They want you. People want you to play. People want to see you play and everybody loves it. That's my two cents on that. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot easier than you think it is to, to get a show going. You just make it happen. You just ask. You, if you, you don't know if you don't ask, it's kind of one of those situations. That's it. Now, if you want to play with like bigger artists, that's going to take some work. You maybe will have to talk to a promoter. Maybe you will have to um, boost posts and pay for advertisements. And I don't know, play the Instagram game play the Twitter and YouTube game and, and do that whole thing. You want to play with the bigger artists, make yourself bigger than life, you know, like start at the, start at the end and work your way back. I guess it's kind of like uh fake it till you make it. One of those situations, you can go that route, but if you just want to play shows, that's easy. And if you don't mind playing for a smaller audience at first and then working your way up to a bigger audience, you can do that too. Just keep playing, just keep going out and keep playing. So that's my two cents on getting booked. It's not that tough. If you want to play with like larger groups, yeah, reach out to promoters, send them some of your music and see what happens. If they like what you're doing, you're going to have a good time. Go play with them.
It's that simple. <laughs> if you're doing something a little bit more experimental, book yourself, book your friends, and just get it done. Okay. Now, we kind of talked about, like, is, is hardware more difficult or less difficult than, um, like, a, a DJ show? And I don't know, actually. I, I honestly don't know the answer to this question um, because the production that goes into designing your... If you're the, if you're the producer, we're, we're coming from a producer perspective here, right? No matter what we're talking about, we're not talking about hardware electronic music in the perspective of somebody, I'm playing somebody else's music or I'm playing a remix of somebody else. Sometimes a remix, maybe if you're playing with a, a phrase sampler like Doctrack or a 404 or something. Yeah, you can do a remix on there. It's a little bit harder to do on a dig attack because of the lack of stereo and the lack of like precise chopping, stuff like that. But uh, so typically you're the producer, right? You're the producer and the performer. And um, that's the perspective that I'm always coming from. I'm never coming from a, I'm a DJ at a wedding or something like that. It's not something that, that we talk about here because it's, that's not what we're doing. So as a producer, playing with a DJ mixer and CDJs versus playing with hardware, which one is harder? I have no idea. You'd have to tell me. But because one of them requires a massive amount of prep on your computer and then the understanding of the DJ workflow, which is not easy. It is very hard. It's similarly difficult to how these machines are difficult. Um, I've watched a lot of tutorials on DJ transitions, and that's how I've designed a lot of the t transitions in the Octatrack, was watching tutorials on how DJs did it in their hardware gear or how people did it on Ableton or Bitwig or Logic. And it's incredibly, incredibly tough. It is definitely to be respected. And, um, you know, I don't want to, I'm never, I don't want to hate on, on that either. So I don't know which one is more difficult. I do know that I haven't been attracted to that personal workflow from my perspective because I'm not usually working in the computer. Now, if you were a computer oriented musician, then the CDJ DJ workflow is going to be more for you, I think, because that's where that music translates the easiest. It's hard to take your Ableton project and put it into an Octatrack and then because you're going to lose a little bit of your sound quality from your Ableton project, you're going to lose those great effects that you had unless you bake them into your stems and you're going to um, have trouble. You are have to learn the off track. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's like that part's really hard. So I, I, I don't know which one is harder. I don't have the answer to that. I wanted, I want to have an answer to that. I don't know if I'll ever have that answer, but I just want to acknowledge that I don't have that answer. And I don't want to be somebody who says that they know better because I don't. I just I want my audience that watches this channel to know that I don't know so that uh, they don't look to me for that answer. Look to someone else and um, know that uh, that I think it's a respected art and that it's really difficult just like this is. That's that. I don't want to talk about it anymore because I feel like I'll just be lying, you know, uh, <laughs> And I, I don't like to do that. I don't like how that feels. So, like, you know, how much... Now, like, we're talking about what gear we use at the show. We're talking about how we get booked. Essentials, you know. Uh, when, uh... When should you show up to these gigs? I would say, you know, get there early. And stay late. That is... That is my motto for going to for performing at a show not not going to a show you want to go to a show leave whenever you want my ears bleed by the end of the show i'm just like i'm cooked but my perspective as a performer i think that it is i want to say like to me i find it a little bit disrespectful sometimes to leave as a, if you're performing with other performers to pack your gear and go before you've seen the rest of the performers play if you're performing with a group so I encourage you, and I don't think this is, I think it's kind of a no-brainer for most people. I encourage you to stick around and get to know the people you played with and make those connections and show up as early as you can and offer to be as helpful as possible. And that's always been the, the case on the, the shows that I've played with people is that that's already instilled in most people. I think that's uh, really important. Um, get familiar with the community, ask a lot of questions, and give away your knowledge freely. 
I think that's really important. If we want to see this community grow, then we need to be really open and we need to share all of our skills and knowledge with people without gatekeeping. You know, I think gatekeeping is a really shitty practice in life and in music. And I don't think that any of us are so important that we need to gatekeep any of our information or genre of music or any of that kind of thing. I think we need to be as diverse and open to all influences of music and culture and just allow it all to kind of show up and, and share the knowledge, you know, go Ricky Tina's on it, you know, share the knowledge, share the power, knowledge, power, that whole thing. That's true. That's just a truth. It's a fundamental truth. Um, and I think that that's something that you want to practice in a live setting with uh, the other performers. That's kind of my, uh, my dialogue on that. That was, how long did I talk about that? 51 minutes straight of me talking nonstop about live hardware electronic music. So now that I've done this endless banter for you, sharing my thoughts with my four shots of espresso that I had, I haven't even cracked open my ice cold drink yet, and it is still cold. Let's see if uh, this is not LaCroix. This is, uh, or LaCroix. People, the French folks were telling me how to say it correctly, but I already forgot. This is made by Kroger. Kroger's probably a bad company or something. I don't know. They're probably bad people. We could just assume that everybody's bad at this point. So whatever, sparkling water, tastes good. Give me money, make my channel, make more money, buy my dog the good dog food, that kind of thing. Good. Good enough. All right. Let's put together the set. Let's go through this whole process. I'm gonna to put together my set. I haven't picked out the order of the songs. Let's go to the old project, and then let's talk about mixing a little bit. I do actually wanna bring up, actually we have another story. I got another story to talk about here. So I'm wearing new headphones. Notice, new headphones. I mean, you probably don't remember what headphones I was wearing before, so it doesn't matter, but let me, I'll tell you. I was wearing DT77 Studios. They're like 180 bucks new. Great sounding headphones. Before I was wearing them, I wore these Tascam headphones, which I love. They're open back headphones. Not good for live streaming. There's an overhead microphone. That's how I do my videos. Excuse me, they're bubbles from the, the drink. And uh, so I, I, was, I was mixing my audio, preparing for shows. I'm wanting to up my game. I'm always just trying to, you know, I want to get better and better and better at doing this stuff. I want to be able to teach people more when I do lessons. I want to be able to have more things to talk about when I'm doing YouTube streams. And so like, I'm, you know, I'm always watching tutorials, reading articles, doing different things, trying new pieces of gear, buying things, returning things. I'm going through this process a lot. And uh, I was thinking that I don't like how my music was sounding on stream sometimes after I stream. So sometimes I'll do a stream, I write some music during the stream, and then I'm like, okay, we just did our whole thing. I go get in my car, I go, me, my wife, and my dog go get in the car, and I make them listen to the stream. I don't make them, I mean, my dog definitely doesn't want to listen, but my wife does, she's really into this, thinks it's awesome. So, she wants to hear it, and I want to show it to her, I'm excited to show it to her, I love showing her my music. And... I'll listen to it and I'm just like, I'll like, I'll be like, oh, so bassy. Like, I'm like, man, I'm mixing the bass, mixing the bass bad, I feel bad about the bass mix. And so um, I decided I need to do something about that. I need to be able to mix the bass better during live, my live production. I don't want to do it later. I don't want to go back and be like, all right, now we got to go to the monitors, turn the monitors up. I live in an apartment. It's like, I got neighbors upstairs, stuff like that. I don't want to bug people. So like, I want to be able to mix better in my headphones. So I picked up some extended bass headphones. These are sure um, mastering headphones and they have extended bass. And I gotta tell you, the DT770 Studios, as classic and wonderful as they are, and they, they do the job, they are not representing your low end. They are incredibly bright because I compared these with my monitors and I have, I forget the model number of Mackies I have, just know that they're good <laughs> i don't know they're like 600 dollars per monitor so because i wanted them to have a lot of bass in them too and i wanted them to have rf shielding in the back so that cell phones and computers and other sort of technology doesn't create some crappy noises those 
speakers and these headphones have about the same amount of bass response. It's quite incredible. So I've been listening to other people's music with these headphones on. I'm like, man, well, you need to work on your mix now. Because now I hear all the bass that I wasn't able to mix. So here's the problem with using the wrong kind of headphones when you're doing music production. If you have a bright mix in your headphones, your reaction to a bright mix is to overplay your bass. So then you bring up the bass line or you use bass instruments that are incredibly subby thinking that you're getting a good bass. And then when you go play, your bass is enormous and it's kind of gross. Or you go in your car and it's just mud. So I realized, okay, got to have closed back headphones because they overhead microphone. Um, and also it just blocks out other sounds while you're mixing. That's also useful. I went in and I went through my set and I've been mixing and I've had to low, I've had to high cut. I mean, uh, kick drums all over the place. I did not realize how much bass was coming through on these kick drums. And um, I've had to high cut bass lines all over the place because they're so bassy. And now I'm getting these much cleaner mixes and they're cleaner in the car and they're cleaner on my studio monitors. And I'll tell you an embarrassing story about my studio monitors really quick. So the same time that I grabbed these new headphones to uh, master my audio or have a better representation of the spectrum of audio that I'm that I'm working in, I'm also using in my mind drawing a picture of the, the spectrum that I'm filling as I'm creating a production. I'm thinking about the low and I'm picturing it's filling up. The high end's filling up and the hi hats come in. The vocals come in. The mid range is starting to fill up. I'm picturing I'm filling space. I'm, I'm running out of room. Right. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like there's a box. I'm filling it with elements that complete the spectrum. You can't have too much in certain areas. Otherwise it gets muddy. Too much over here is too bright. Too much over here is too mud. Too much over here. It's too midi. That sounds gross too. My speakers were on the side, right? There are tilted speakers. It's, I don't think it's recommended that they do that. I, I don't believe that people, I don't really know. I don't know. Let's forget the side thing, but my speakers were on the side. Okay. I have this really long monitor. I have one of those <laughs> angled monitors. And an edge of the monitor was going through the lower speaker cone on both sides of my speakers. And I didn't think anything of it. I was like, nah, it's probably not doing anything. I'm sure a million audio engineers are just like, you are so wrong. That's so stupid. Like, how could you do that? How could you not have thought about that? And sure, you're right. Whatever. I was definitely blocking a significant portion of the low end was getting blocked by just part of my speaker cone because that's the part that the monitor was obstructing. And I turned my speakers back right side up, which made it so the monitor no longer blocks any part of the cone. And my low end came back through my speakers. And I realized that my monitors and my DT77 Pros were both doing the same thing. They were both, uh, what's going on here? They were both muting my low end and leaving the high end both sets of audio so within the same day i get a new pair of mastering headphones that have a nice close back on them so it mutes out the room but extended low range and i switch the monitors over revealing my low end again in my speakers and i could hear all of the poor mix that i was having and it's like it's an embarrassing story to be honest as somebody who's like trying to help people get you know, better at music production and stuff like whatever it is. Definitely. It's the truth. It's what happened. We all have these things happen in our lives, but I'm really glad that I corrected it. So if there's anything you could take from it, you know, of course, don't obstruct your speakers. That's the silly thing. But even the smallest obstruction, we're not talking. My speakers weren't blocked entirely. That's that'd be silly. It was just a part of the speaker cone was getting obstructed. And just that little part of the speaker cone, in fact, did disguise my mix as something that was a more a cleaner mix than it was because of that. So my low end wasn't being revealed. So I thought that was important. I wanted to share that with you. I do think the DT 770s are a great pair of headphones. I don't think they're ideal for mix, mixing electronic music. I do think something with an extended low, lower range is better. And you should look into that <laughs> maybe spend some money. Um, and, uh, before I get back into, uh, just showing you how I'm going to set up this live hardware set, I'm going to say what's up to the chat. We haven't done that. I see there's a lot of dialogue going on. Um, and the chat goes up 
really far, so I'm gonna have to just say what's up to right now. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Circo is coming to play. Circo's in the chat. What's up, Circo? Circo is coming to play here in Seattle this weekend, Sunday at Substation. And uh, it's going to be a really great time. And hopefully, if we can, maybe have Circo come back in person for another episode of Electron Talk. Talk about the electronic music workflow and maybe do another little performance for you. We'll see. So that would be a good time. What's what's up, everybody? Femto. What's up, Jordan? Blake. Tonesmith. Echo. Above the trees. AK-10. Jeffrey Noir. I'm not sure how to say that. I'm sorry. Toby. What's up, dude? Um, so good to see everybody. Welcome to the stream. We've been talking a lot today. This is a talking day. Uh, I wanted this to be you know, full of all the information that goes through my head before I play a show. I'm going to go over to my new project now and uh, show off the new tunes, which we wrote together on stream, because I write almost I almost write all the beginning of my music on all the live streams. That's where I get my music done. The rest of the week, I kind of detail and tune them into uh, finished finished songs, which I didn't accomplish on half set, only two of the songs. So I'm going to share them with you. I still don't think they're done. I feel like they're always kind of a work in progress. I will continue to work on them, but I've gotten a lot further than I was before. So let's jump over to the newer music production where I have all new sounds that I brought into my Dig Attack and kind of go through a little bit of that. I'll show you some of the mixing I was doing on there and uh, we'll go from there. Hello from Austria. What's up? What's up, Shihokyo? I uh, show hope yet. I don't know. Christopher Floyd, what's up, dude? Always a pleasure. Hi Fi, what's up, Harry? You're playing your first gig in four days. Hey, nice job. Good for you. I think that's awesome. What a fun time, right? Such a good time. Okay, let's flip it over. So I'm gonna go over to the new set. Um, I usually name my sets the name of the template. So this is using this project is using Ultimate Effects, and uh, because this I use the Octray Performance templates that I make for my live shows, because uh, that's why I made them was so that I could use them for live shows. And uh, this particular set uses a different template than the new set that I'm using. So I actually have to switch to a new project, and uh, which is a pain, but. That's what we have to do. So I'm going to go to a new project. It's in the new Remixer Octatrack Effects template. So it's called Remixer Deprascope, which was just some made up word. Um, but it kind of reminded me of Depth and Necroscope, which is a, a fantastic sci-fi vampire book. <laughs> I'm really into science fiction. And uh, Necroscope was a pretty gnarly, pretty gnarly series. Yes, we will save it because we have done some stuff that I want to save. Okay. Bank one, pattern one. Stay so, Got to stay to this is going to be the opener track for me in my shows. Kind of starts off with this like chill house vibe. For a long time, my patterns for my songs would be typically about, you know, two to four patterns. This song is six patterns long, and that's because most of the elements are playing all the time, so I'm not bringing in that many elements, so I have to go through the patterns quickly. That's something you have to think about when you're producing your music on hardware, is the limitations of how many patterns you have. So do you make, you know, start off with everything muted and build everything up slowly like you would in a techno production or some techno productions, or do you have everything already playing? And then you're just moving through patterns and it's just, you know, pre-muted or pre-unmuted and all that kind of stuff. Pattern mutes. Those are the purple mutes on the electron boxes. This is my workflow. The global mute workflow is a little bit more for improv techno, I think, because it uh, just the, the, it's a different kind of control. This lets you have like these preset benchmarks that you hit as you move from pattern to pattern. So this song would start off this way. And I'll use an 
Octrack performance template effect to bring in these other elements, which is gonna be a kick, a hi-hat, and a bass line, I think. So we go. And this opening track is gonna be chill. I'm gonna let this play for a bit, you know? Not even let the little pad play for a while. Maybe I wouldn't have brought that in yet. I might have brought the <laughs> the clap in. I think that this was actually supposed to be unmuted because this is this like breathing arp. But something I like to have in the, like this pattern is already old and it should have been transitioned to the next pattern already. So I think this sound was supposed to already be there. Hear how this arpeggio is like slowly fading in. It took a while for it to come in and that's because it's a slow moving LFO opening up a set of 16th notes. And what I want this to be is this undulating sound that's keeping my pattern sounding fresh because there's new sounds slowly coming in that are exciting sounds, like they're big, they're stereo. Here we are in the next pattern. As you can see, Currently, maybe I need to work out how I'm gonna do this, but I only have one new sound I can bring in. So I want to take, I actually wanted to do that and have the vocal not be there when this hat comes in, because I want to Give and take, give and take. Take an element out, bring an element in, take an element out, bring an element in, so it feels like a new pattern. This way I don't have to write as many patterns. I think that's really useful. This is the energy part, like we're starting to build towards energy. If you're familiar with a lot of the music I write, I tend to go into like a bit of a rocky EDM vibe. Later in the songs, it's usually a it's gradual. And that's definitely what's gonna happen in this song. Now, when I am performing, I do think it's important that you know where the instruments are. This one is harder for me because uh, I wasn't paying as much attention to where the instruments were on my syntax at the time. But some of these elements, I like to go function yes, do a temporary save all the time while I'm performing. And like here, I can go like, Here we go. Get that energy going. Still in the same pattern.
still same pattern, modulation, it went up a fifth. That was not a good filter for that move. I lost a lot of my energy. Not cool. So, should have picked something else. A lot of effects, I don't have them all memorized. All right, we're gonna skip to the crescendo of the song. Whoa. That's not right. That's right, I remember what I was doing. I was teaching a lesson and I changed the tempo to show somebody something. So that's really important. Good thing I checked, right? Let's do it again. Let's get that transition good. Got four bars. And this is the end of the song. There's some new elements to bring in. I'm able to do some changes. Okay, so now let's go to the next song. We can either do a loop, we can do an effects transition. What's on here, anything? Yeah. We can do a tape stop into it. Kind of an abrupt stop into a new song, but I think it would still sound dope, especially on a big system. Kind of a fun opening track to something that turns into more drum and bass later. I want to put some vocals over this, which I haven't done yet. There's some elements to bring in here. As you can see, some stuff is pre-unmuted waiting for me. I'm gonna have to go back through and redo this after, after this. I do think like some some sort of vocal line would be pretty important here, which I don't have in here yet. But I do have a track available for it. Oh, I should add that.
And of course, we can do some remixing. Here we go. Got a live remix. Little breakdown, right? We can do that on the fly with the Remixer 1.2.2 performance template that I made on the arc track. I love it. I'm excited. I haven't played out with this template yet, so I'm stoked to get to do this live because I don't usually chop and remix live that much. I usually just live loop. Let's see here, which one do we want? Now, <laughs> I'm still struggling to figure out how do I go from here to this? I think it needs to use a bigger buildup, like... Or maybe I bring all the elements out and then do the climb? I don't know exactly yet. Like, there's not much for me to do here. I think that this pattern is just fine the way it is. Live on stream, the magnet arrives. So I have a couple more songs on this set. These are the only two that are finished. So I'm gonna play these two for sure in Portland and maybe the other songs on the set at the substation show. As you can see, there's still work to be done. I have two more days to prepare, but check this out. This just happened live on stream everybody had been asking me to make magnets for the octatrack performance templates check it out the prototype is here but bam it sticks to the octatrack ta da <laughs> i can't believe it worked oh my gosh
Wow, turned out really good. Way better than I thought. Well, these aren't for sale yet, but I will. I haven't had them made. This is the prototype, but it looks like it worked. Works really good. Wait, let's test. Never mind. I was going to say test it on my other ox track, but I forgot it has to stick around it too. Cool. There's a couple types. Check this out. Here's a blank one. Just for writing your parts on a magnet with an erasable marker. And you can take it off. Wonk. And clean it. Yeah, yeah. The white tape magnet. Although it has the parts written right there. We don't need that. I guess I need to take that off the magnet. Well, it's just a prototype anyway. Hey, that's sick. <laughs> Turned out so good. Oh my god. So happy. Can't wait to share these with you. For those of you on my Patreon, 100% first tips to you folks, if you're interested, I will hook it up. Um, wow. I'm so impressed. Let's leave that there for now. It looks the same. Cool. So the other songs on the set, we got this drum and bass song. I have no idea what to do. Got some wub wub. I think this would be a great song to play live, but it's so not there yet. And I think it could use a little bit of this 303. It's got this part, it's really wonky and alternative. Do I ever do live vocals when I'm performing? I, um, I should. Singing is like one of my biggest passions in music. And I always use my voice in my music. It's a hard line when I'm doing so much with these machines to also sing at the same time to do this kind of situation. But I am I think I'm working up to it and I do want to start introducing more of my acoustic guitar singer songwriter stuff into my electronic music and maybe have that be perhaps a separate project i don't really know this is the drum and bass song that's all i have for it so far that's why it's not ready for the show and then the last song that i have is this one which we started last week and it is definitely not ready and uh it starts off with everything unmuted we have We got this like techno. I wanted to make some techno last week, so that's what we did. This one you would definitely build up to, so I think this song would be best if it started off with like. This is the Tom. This is how the song would start. This is a techno track, so we would be building, 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 building.
maybe do get some like big space going on with the drums. Don't always have to use the scene effects, you can do the manual effects too. And then you just get ready to cue it. Yes. Nailed it. That's hard to do. It's like the crisscross. Oh, that depth too high. I thought I had another four bars to go. I was wrong. <laughs> and that would have been a part of the show too. Like that will happen to me in a live show. I didn't realize track four was just more of the acid. So this is why I'm, this is why these two songs are not going to be in the set. They're not. I'm not. I don't know them well enough. I've just been writing the elements so far. I don't know how to perform them yet. The other ones are much more fully fleshed out and constructed songs. But I do think this is a fun one. And we wrote it together with your help last week. I think someone even gave me the the line. They said something about talking about reality and your mind. The lyric was, "Reality is a construct of your mind." Not the most clever thing in the world, but probably true. Don't really know. What happened? Your rack not selling? Uh, it's all Modbang and Easybot now. Wait, what are we talking about? You talking about me? What I do? Yes, I am a I am all Modbang and Easybot. I need to watch EasyBot more often. Oh, I agree. Sure do. Uh, the baseline's super filthy. You love it? Oh, thanks so much. Kush, kush. Sounded good. Thanks. Well, thanks for all the all the kind words about the music. I appreciate that. You know, in a lot, I think that it sounds better than it's ever sounded. My music production does because of my headphone change, as I did a lot of this. Like if we look, I think I've done this on this track. You can see this is my kick drum, bass with filter, kick drum. That's not that much of it. I could probably I could probably cut out a lot more of that kick drum. But the kick drum sounds pretty good there, so maybe not. High pass filters, high pass filters go a long way. Oh my gosh. High pass filter is probably your should be your most beloved filter. Low pass filters great for sound design. High pass filters amazing for mixing. They are essential. Get to know your high pass filter. In fact, I would say if you had very few options for live performance effects, I would say the one you don't want to skimp on is a high pass filter and a delay. If you can high pass into a delay, that's kind of that's honestly all you need to be able to move out of pattern to pattern and track to track or some sort of uh, isolator where it removes the lows, you know, it just, we just want to get rid of the low end so that it creates a sense of relief. And that relief allows us to build suspense. So the delay is the suspense, the high pass is the relief and bringing the high pass back out or removing the high pass and letting your lows come back is the resolution. And that is the experience. Uh, that's the, like the techno live hardware, electronic music experience is is like creating suspense and giving resolution to suspense, creating suspense and resolution, suspense and resolution. How much can you do that? 
how often can you build that up um, and bring that in and out? That is the typical experience with Electronica, which is more of my uh, experience. I just go bigger, 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 bigger with my music a lot. Like I'll bring a lot of melodic elements in. We'll start putting chorusing type uh, melodic elements. We'll emphasize another pattern by duplicating it with another sound and layering it on top, maybe taking an octave up. We'll do modulations where we take the entire track and we modulate all the melodic elements. We keep the drum elements the same, but in terms of pitch, but we modulate all of the pitch on every single synth element up. I'll do that as opposed to high pass filtering with delays, stuff like that. That'll be how I create my, my suspense to resolution is that we'll just take it to the next level. I don't know. That's been my experience of stuff that I like to do. It's more of an EDM workflow, I think, sometimes. Great stream with practical info for live. Oh, thank you so much. You wish you could steal my syntax baseline mojo? Well, I am working on a syntax sound pack, and I've made a couple of new sounds this week, so uh, I'm going to keep working on it. As soon as I hit, like, the 50, the 50 preset mark, usually I just sound design and they live in the project, but I've been saving the sounds so that I could share them with people. As soon as I hit, like, the 50 mark of saved sounds, I will share it on the Patreon. So if you're on the Patreon then you'll have access to it on any tier because uh, everything goes to every tier except for the live stuff where we meet up and stuff like that. That's some specific tier functions on the Patreon. Um, that kind of brings us to the conclusion of the stream, I think. Uh, I don't have much more energy in, in me from talking for an hour and a half straight without any pause for the most part. Thank the Lord I am capable of doing that on YouTube, I guess. Just don't shut up, right? I'm pretty quiet, typically, but on YouTube, I'm not quiet at all. Um, so if you like these kind of streams, if you're interested in this kind of content, you can visit patreon.com slash easybot, and that is how you can support this YouTube channel. Keep this channel going where we can talk about different techniques, performance, workflows, uh, sound design, you name it. I share everything that I learn with this YouTube channel. This is my outlet for connecting with the community in the live hardware electronic music space, but just connecting with the music community. Uh, if so, if you're into that too, you can visit patreon.com slash easybot. If you want to get the performance templates that I use, you want to get your hands on this new magnet sticker. The first to know about it is going to be the folks on my Patreon, and then you'll be able to get it um, from modbank.com, which is my live hardware electronic music store, which has all sorts of cool stuff like the cables that you saw on the table, those clear MIDI cables, clear balance cables, TRS, Patch cables, the whole thing. That's my stuff. I designed those cables. I literally designed those cables. Even the screws in my stands, I designed myself. Like, uh, I don't know. I like it. I like doing this stuff. I'm very committed to the hardware electronic music community and uh, sharing whatever I learn with everybody that I can and uh, keeping everybody plugged in and just lifting up, lifting each other up. Those are my core spiritual principles and I stick to them. And everything I do, hopefully, that's my goal. I try to, at least. And I hope that comes through on this YouTube channel as well. Um, so you can visit coffee.com slash easybot, where you can also get the performance templates and just buy them if you're not into subscription services. I know a lot of people don't like to subscribe to Patreons and stuff like that. I like it. I subscribe to a lot of Patreons, but I understand people don't want to see that reoccurring payment going through. It gets annoying, whatever. <laughs> or, or hurts your feelings or something. Hurts your bank account's feelings. But uh, thank everybody for... Thank you all for showing up. This is an unsponsored stream. Nothing like that going on. I'm just very happy to share what I know with the community. So uh, give this uh, video a like. Share it with your friends. Show your parents. Let your dog watch it. Take your dog for a walk. That's probably what I'm going to do here shortly after I make some lunch. Uh, you're a lovely bunch of people. I hope to see you at these shows. This is the last thing. I hope to see you at these shows we have the one in portland where i'll be playing with sam shankar brother vs robot flakes and myself at atlantis lounge on march 7th that's day after tomorrow at 7 p.m it's a 10 dollars show i thought it was a free show it's a 10 dollars show pay 10 bucks come on come check it out and help support the portland music community they and everybody else needs your love and support and then also here in seattle a show put on by me Basement State and Modular Nights. Um, I kind of spearheaded this event with Modular Nights. And 
We are taking over Modular Nights for Sunday night with a bunch of amazing performers, starting off with Wet Paint, Project 32, myself, Leandro, Mikey303, Hair Shield, Circo flying in from Denver, and Planar Drift. This is going to be an amazing show. Please come out to Substation. It is 100% free. It's at 5.30 p.m. on March 10th. Uh, we're going to try, and any any fundage that we raise there, we're going to donate to Patchworks, the synth shop here in Seattle, so that we can keep a synth shop going here locally in Washington State because it's the only synth shop that we have, so it's really important. Please come out to these shows. Show some love. Uh, I haven't played in a couple of months. I don't think I've played since November, so I'm excited and nervous to play two shows basically back-to-back, -back. and I would love to have your support, So, and so would everybody else on these bills. We'd love to see you. It's a really good time. Come out and connect. If you want to play a show, you can reach out to me at mod at modbang.com, and I'll see if I can get you booked. Right now I'm booked all the way out till July for the shows that I'm in charge of booking. But uh, if you're a local or you're coming in from out of town nearby and you want to play a live hardware electronic music show with a pretty decent crowd, I'm not going to lie, it's a good number of people come out to our shows now after a year and a half of putting these on. Mod at modbang.com. That'll be me responding to you, and I'll see if I can get you on the bill. Y'all are fantastic. Thank you for hanging out in the chat. I hope this was useful. I will see you next week. Peace. Thank you.